you've heard it said is Jesus' reference to how the Pharisees were using the Word of God. But I say unto you is his corrective action for the people to realize that just because they said it doesn't mean they're living it right. It is a criticism of contemporary religious use of the Word of God. Jesus says, let, let me make this clear because you've heard it, but you've not seen it correctly. They are misusing it. They're misapplying it. They're putting their own spin on it. So I want you to hear what I say. Let me make clear for you what the will of God is in the word of God that you just read. Yes. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and praise the Lord, everybody. You have come back into the house of God to give him your heart. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is a good place to be. It's a good place to be. I don't know about you, but I have been giving God my best because he gives his best to me. And the only thing we could actually do in this moment is to lift up his name. Are you here to give yourself away to him today? Join us as we sing this familiar song. Self away. That's a personal testimony. Come on, tell them. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Hey, say, so you. That's good. Come on and say, I give myself away. Whoa, I give myself, give myself away. So you, so you can you somebody me. say, I give myself away. God wants to use you today. Oh, I give myself away. So you. That's beautiful. Come on, sing the verse together. Here I am. Here I stand. Tell him. Lord, my life is in your hand. Lord, I'm longing. Lord, I'm longing. That's it. Come on, say. Yes. To see. You. Come on. Your Say, I give myself, I give myself away. Yeah. Lord, I give myself away. So you, so you, so you. Here we are, Lord. Give, give myself, myself away. Yeah. Sing it to your Lord. I give myself Whoa. away. Two to 
together. Take my heart. Take my heart. Take my life. Take That's good. My life. As a living sacrifice. As a yeah. living oh. sacrifice. Come on, say all my dreams. All my dreams. All my plans. All my Come on plans. and place them right in his hands. Lord. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I give myself. Yep. God, we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves away. God, have your way. sing to your father and tell him I give myself away so you can I give myself away he wants to use you today yeah I give myself away can't use me come on and say thank you Lord please use me Come on and bless the name of the Lord where you are. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. Come on and say thank you. Hallelujah. Now you know what? You know we're going to turn it up a little bit. I need you to turn to your name and say, he's all right with me. Tell him. Tell your neighbor behind you, he's just all right. And if you don't mind, come up on your feet with us. Put your hands together. Get ready to give God praise the way we know how. Come on, come on. Right there, family. Put those. 
those hands together right there. Come on, let me see them. Hey! That's right, come on. That's right, come on. That's right, come on. He's all right. Just so right. He's just right. He's just. He's just right. Let me see those hands. Come on, family. Where you at today? Hey, where you where you at today? All the all the worshipers that came in. Come on, let's go. He's singing. All the praises on the sing. Sing it from your belly. Today, what you say? Anybody come to give God praise? Come on, 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 I tried him, I tried him, and I found out he's all right. Anybody come to try the Lord?
Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Everybody, if you know he's all right, come on. Hey. Somebody sing it. this morning because he who has performed a good work in you is faithful to perform it. No matter what you're going through, he's faithful to perform it. He'll clean you up inside. He's just all right, church. Give God some praise this morning. He's just all right. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Oh, God, thank you. You are changing us from glory to glory this morning. Hallelujah. Just all right. Just all right, God. Just all right. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Glory, God. We give you honor and praise. You are just all right. Hallelujah. And beloved of God. Because God is performing a good work in you, hear this word from the Paul's letter to the church at Rome, 12th chapter, 14th to the 18th verse. Because God's performing a good work in you. And so, bless people who harass you. Uh-huh, go ahead, say amen now. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good, if possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. God is performing a good work in you, in me, the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Help us, Holy Ghost. <laughs> and beloved, online and in this place, we come knowing that there are burdens. We come knowing that there are challenges. If you faced a challenge this week, just raise your hand. God sees you. God knows. God is at work in us. And we come also praying for those whom we know are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Two names this day. Lamanthia Barfield, and Blake Roberts, we are praying for you in the home going of your brother and uncle, Aaron Eugene Barfield. Deacon Bessie Johnson, we are praying for you in the transition of your sister-in-law, Judith Warsham. Beloved, if you raised your hand, what are those challenges? If you're in your own valley, in your own wilderness in this season of Lent, what are you facing? Who are you praying for? Speak those circumstances out loud. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, I am grateful that in your biblical word, every garden lulls your people into a false sense of ability. 
Gardens get us in trouble in the Bible. But Jesus' wildernesses transform us. Wildernesses call us to our knees and call us to cry out your name. So God, in these wilderness moments, make us know you are doing a great thing. You are doing a new work. Come and tabernacle with your sons and your daughters and usher us through whatever challenge. Usher these names we've called aloud and in the secret of our hearts through the valley of the shadow of the death of a loved one, of a dream, of a relationship, whatever seems to be no longer alive. God, you're able. And we, your sons and daughters, have come with our hands uplifted to say, have your perfect way. Gracious God, indeed do that new thing in us and bring us forth through the test with a testimony for the world about a God who can do anything but fail. We thank you, God. We praise you, God. We believe you. And when we have no strength, we rely on you. We rely on you even when we have strength, God. We rest in the palm of the divine hand. Now, God, open our hearts to worship. Bless your son, Howard John, to preach the word of God that we might be transformed. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for it is do your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And because we know this to be true, we can sing with gusto our hymn of rejoicing, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Come on, everybody, blessed assurance and blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress. Oh, what a fortress. Of glory, of glory divine. divine. Heir of salvation. Heir of salvation. Purchased. Purchased of God. Born of his spirit. Born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. Washed in his blood. Come on, let's get it. This is my story. This is my story. This is my this song. Is my Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's go to the second stanza. Perfect. Of rapture now burst on my side. Angels are singing. Those are mercy. Whispers of love. Come on, this is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior. This is my story. Here with his goodness and lost in his love. Now sing it like you mean it. Yeah. This is my song. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Let's sing that chorus one more time. One more time. This is my story. This is my Do it old school. This is my story. This is my story. 
This is my song. This is my song. Hallelujah. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior. All the day long. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. This is my song. Now lift your voice and praising my Savior. Praising my the day long. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Why don't you greet somebody this morning as we pass the peace? Alfred Street. To our guests who grace us with the presence of God by your presence in worship, to our family and friends who are connected across the world wide web, grace and peace be unto each and every one of you from God who loves us as our mother and our father in Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. I pray that you've entered this space today grateful for all that you know the Lord has done for you in your life. All of us have some secret blessings that we don't really tell our neighbor because if you know I needed God to do that, you might be embarrassed for me. But some of us know that God has answered some prayers. God has cleaned up some messes. God has removed some obstacles. Wait, wait. And God has kept some stuff quiet. Praise be to the Lord. That God's mercies endure forever. We come in this moment of worship mindful that it is only of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed and that we are redeemed because of the great sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. We share an open communion with all who accept and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you entered in today prayerfully you receive the elements of our Lord's Supper if you're a believer and you did not, would you simply wave a hand? There are deacons who will joyfully serve you even now. And to our family who's worshiping online, we invite and encourage you to make sacred this moment of remembrance as you take hold of bread and cup to join with us as we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.
As we're coming today, I want to lift up the name of one of our faithful musicians, Melvin Bryant Jr., whose father recently went home to be with the Lord. We pray for the Bryant family this morning, as well as all those other concerns that Reverend Zena and, and that we brought into this space. This is a moment of remembrance and celebration. Carl Marcus, I hear in my spirit what was playing earlier. If you join in with me as we, oh come, let us, that, that's not just a Christmas hymn, it's a hymn of worship, of adoration and love for the one who loved us so much. Oh come, let us adore. bread we eat. It represents the broken body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who alone is our Christ. Crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended, making intercessions for our sins, and one day soon returning. Let us break bread and eat together. In the cup is a memorial of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins and the redemption of our souls. For nothing can wash our sins away other than the blood of Jesus. Let us drink together. God, we receive in our faith what you offer freely in your grace, the complete forgiveness of our sins, the eternal security of our soul's salvation, the precious indwelling of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us into the center of your will, and the awesome opportunity we have to share your transformative love with others as we seek to make more disciples. God, thank you for forgiving us. May we not be hypocritical in failing to forgive one another. Thank you for loving us. Teach us now to love one another. This is our prayer and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. As we gather in this space today, we begin by welcoming 
the presence of God and the presence of our guests and our visitors. Everyone is special today. I'm grateful to God to have back with us one of our favorite, one of my favorite preachers of the gospel, the Reverend Dr. Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook is with us. Ambassador, if you would stand, we welcome you back into to your home away from home here at the Alpha Street Baptist Church. There may be some other guests who are gathered with us today. If you're a guest of our church family, you don't mind us recognizing you, would you just wave a hand in the air that we may thank God for all of our guests? If you've got a hand raised next to you, do me a favor, be extra kind, let them know we welcome them into worship on today. We're grateful that God put worship on your mind and Alfred Street in your heart. Our prayers that God would give you traveling grace and mercy to wherever home may be. And if ever you're in our local area, please know that you're wanted and welcome. If you're watching online, we invite you to type in the chat where you're watching from, that we may also celebrate and embrace you with those who are guiding worship online. Today, we also recognize the goodness of God and the celebration of birthdays. I was walking around, there's some folk that God has put another candle on your cake. If you're celebrating your recent birthday, would you please stand and allow us to thank God for you. All of our birthdays, would you stand? Alpha Street, help me thank God. Happy birthday to all of you. Amen. If someone stood up next to you for a birthday, go and give them a dollar. Amen. Give them a dollar. Uh, say happy birthday unto you. And finally, we recognize the gift of love that God has granted to us and our couples, our spouses that are celebrating another marital anniversary. If you're here today and you all are celebrating another year of God's keeping you together, we'd ask that you stand and remain standing that we may celebrate with you any anniversaries to celebrate in Alpha Street today. Amen. All the way up in the back in the balcony, congratulations. Help me thank God for them. Now, you all the way out back, so you got to shout it out loud and proud. How many years are you all celebrating? 27, congratulations on your 27th wedding anniversary. Blessings unto you. Listen, family, there's just some quick announcements I'm going to lift up. We're going into the word of God. We prepare our hearts in giving. Royal priesthood is going to bless us in song. In preparation for that, I want you to be mindful that one of our, one of our critical um, ministries within the church are the ministries around our children and our youth. We're seeking to make certain that they fellowship together. I want to let you know that this Friday, our Junior Youth Fellowship Fridays is beginning on this Friday, March 8th, if you've got a child between second and eighth grade, we invite you to register for them to join in with us at Bowl America out in Burke, Virginia from 7 to 9 p.m. I remember one of the great joys of being raised in the church were those outings and fellowships with other church members, and we encourage you to make certain that your children are raised in the fellowship of faith. If you're a parent and you've raised a child, you know that your greatest competition will always be their best friend. So make certain that you give them friends whose other families are raising them to know and love and serve Jesus Christ. It gives you a fighting chance. So once again, register online if you've got a second to eighth grader this Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. at Bold America. You all know that on the second Saturdays of the month, we are worshiping on Saturday evenings beginning at 6 p.m. for our right-handed fellowship, our baptism, and our communion. I invite you to join in with us this Saturday, March the 9th at 6 p.m., as we baptize new believers, as we extend the right hand of fellowship to our new family, and we take the Lord's Supper together as one body in Christ, I want you to join in with us this Saturday as you are able. And you all know that we're in Lent. We're in the season of making our way towards the cross of Calvary. I encourage you to go to online to see all that happens in Lent as we make sacred this moment of sacrifice, as we get ready for Holy Week, as we have our daily devotionals. As we get ready for Monday, Thursday, and our foot washing, Good Friday, and Sisters at the Cross, as we get ready for Easter celebration, both at sunrise service and our regular morning service, we want you to be informed and be able to participate and to pray with us. Our journey begins this Tuesday as we enter the season of March gladness. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m., I am pleased to present and to share with you one of my favorite preachers of the gospel who will come and lead us in worship and the word of God. It is an amazing time of worship and revival. I invite you to try to make your way to the building. If you can't, just watch us online. But this week, we want to welcome from Nashville, Tennessee, the Reverend Dr. John Faison, who is an amazing gift to the body of Christ. A powerful preacher, a brother beloved, and he's even a good Omega man. Amen. I'm, I'm excited to welcome him to the church on this Tuesday. Won't you join us in worship as we go into March gladness? That being said, I invite and encourage you now to be prayerful over what God will move upon your heart to do when it comes to giving. We don't believe in begging at Alpha Street. We don't even raise an official offering. 
Because at the end of the day, you know more than anyone else how good God has been to you. And only you know if you've been faithful unto the Lord. I invite and encourage you now to sincerely, sincerely invite the Lord to move upon your heart to support the ministry of our church family, to make glorious the name of Jesus Christ, to continue to touch those who are in need of feeling the transformative love of Jesus Christ. There's so many different online platforms you can use that are at your discretion. We invite and encourage you to make sure you capture one of those if you're online. Don't just watch worship, but join us in worship also in our time of giving. Why don't you bow with me now as we get ready to pray, and then we receive the word of God in song and then in sermon. God, we thank you for the blessings that are innumerable. Things, oh God, that you've done that we've even forgotten. We all stand and sit in this place as recipients of your grace. And in gratitude now, we give back unto you the tithe, the offering that the Holy Spirit moves upon our heart to do so. God, teach us to be obedient. Allow us to experience the joy of giving. Allow us to see the fruit of our giving in lives that are touched and transformed. And ultimately, God, we pray that you look upon us and say, well done. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who is our Christ. Amen. Before Roy Priest bless us a song, I'm asking for you all's prayer. We are back in a major growth season in the church where God continues to add those who enjoy worship and to fellowship with us. And as such, you know, we have multiple services and there's an amazing ministry in between called Sunday School. Uh, whenever service goes long at eight o'clock, Sunday School gets challenged. And so, as leadership, we've been praying about ways to make space and room for all the amazing things God does. And one of them is to make certain that we're getting out on time at eight. And the, the, the most adjustable part of service is the length of that preacher. That preacher can sometimes be a little long winded. So I'm asking you to pray for your preacher. Uh, he's learning to edit the sermons and get them in a 28 to 29 minute version. Uh, so, so if the sermon goes fast and it's shorter, I don't want y'all to think something's wrong. Amen. I'm fine. I need your prayers. We're trying to accommodate everything, do things decently and in order. So if you would pray that we get out on time, Sunday school will bless your life, and then we'll continue on in worship. Come on, Royal Priesthood. Bless us. Praise the Lord, everybody. This special selection entitled, Not to Us, But to Your Name Be the Glory. We're joined by our guest soloist. Please welcome Miss Anitra McKinney.
In all of the things you brought us through, be the glory. Be the glory. Won't you pray with me? And now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. To him and him alone be the glory, the honor, and the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In this season of Lent, I want to invite you both this Sunday and the next couple Sundays that God graces us to gather into the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, found in the Gospel of Matthew. And today, if you would navigate your way to the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, that first book of the New Testament, there's a word with profound power and teaching. I think God wants to speak and watch us live. If you're able, we ask that you stand as together we hear the reading of the word of God from Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse number 21. This morning I'm reading out the New International Version of God's word. As long as your book says Bible, you are okay. Listen to what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember 
that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Do me a favor, share today's sermon title with your neighbor. Just tell them, neighbor, that's what he said. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. That's what he said. Al, I was watching a documentary just this week about designer knockoffs and how China has become the largest producer of pirated products in the world. You may not know this, but there are companies and countries that are proficient at copying trademarked merchandise and creating knockoffs that look and feel like the real thing. The documentary traced the history of knockoffs that used to be cheap, easily recognizable counterfeits have now evolved into what the industry calls superfakes. Superfakes look so much like the real thing that they can not only fool the average consumer, but they can fool most retailers as well. You may not know this, but superfakes in 2022 accounted for 4.2 trillion dollars of commercial business. 4.2 trillion dollars for super fake knockoffs. Sharice is driven by a generation of social media that is obsessed with brand names and material goods. And their obsession has driven the market with knockoffs of Gucci, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Cartier, Yeezys, and YSL. A matter of fact, now to ball out, you don't need a black American Express card. You don't need an account at Neiman Marcus. You don't even need to make six figures. You can go down to Canal Street on New York, in New York. You can roll up to the flea market in Baltimore. You can go down to Rivertown Mall out Knox and Hill. Or if your beauty shop and barber salon, barbershop is in the neighborhood, all you got to do is sit around on a Saturday and you can grab something that looks and feels like the real thing. These super fakes are popular with Generation Z and one sister was asked why she prefers super fake knockoffs and post them on Instagram, and here's what she said. She said, because they look like the real thing, but they don't cost as much. It looks real, but it doesn't cost as much. It feels real, but it doesn't cost as much. Y'all, I stand here today to tell you that China is not the only country that is proficient at creating counterfeit knockoffs. But there is a segment of American society that is good at producing and proliferating a counterfeit Christianity. A super fake variant version of Christianity that might fool you because it looks like the real thing. It just don't cost as much. But, but, but beloved, be careful. There's a knockoff Christianity becoming popular in the United States. It's got all the signs and the trademarks of Christianity. 
It sings the hymns. It reads the Bible. It worships on Sunday morning. It's got a cross in the sanctuary right next to the American flag. It condemns people to hell. It judges who is and who is not authentic as a Christian. It reads the Bible. It looks like Christianity. But it don't cost as much. It doesn't cost you loving your enemies. There's no requirement that you pray for them that despitefully use you. There's no self-denial involved. There's no being kind to the stranger and opening your door to the foreigner. There's no loving them that hate you and being kind to them that abuse you. It allows you to be judge and, and not God. It allows you to go on life without making amends for anything you've done wrong. And it might fool you because it looks like true faith. It holds a Bible in its hand. It lifts up laws, it cites scripture, it, it quotes verses of the Bible to get you to believe that it is authentic. But when you look deeply at this counterfeit Christianity, you will find some problems in its use of Bible. It quotes law more than gospels. It's good on Moses but it's light on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's based on the opinion of Paul more than the words of Jesus. It's memorized the Ten Commandments, but it's forgotten the Sermon on the Mount. It has a clear definition of abomination, but it's fuzzy on grace. And y'all, I just need to tell you that I am suspect of anything calling itself Christian that does not begin in scriptures written in red. I, I, I'm slow to purchase any theology that lifts up Moses and Paul to the same level of Jesus Christ. I'm impressed with the ability to quote Old Testament law and New Testament letters, but for me, Christianity does not begin in Leviticus or Romans. Christianity begins in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, y'all, I'm sorry. I know this may offend you. I am not a follower of Paul. I am not trying to mimic in my model my life after Moses. I'm trying to live my life in the image and the life of Jesus Christ. And for me, the question of authenticity of our faith is not how much Bible it quotes, but how close it is to the life of Jesus Christ. You can't fool me by adding scripture to it. Because everything that is biblical is not Christological. Everything that says Bible is not in line with Jesus Christ. Let me argue my case before you walk out. That seems to be at the core of one of the teachings of Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is unique to the Gospel of Matthew. You can only find it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Dr. Judy and Dr. Zena will tell you that scholars debate whether this was one sermon given at one time on a mountain in northern Israel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. There are those who believe that it is the compilation of all the teachings of Jesus compiled into one sermon at the hand of Matthew to put them all together. In any case, it is the longest 
continuous section of red in all the Bible. In these 111 verses that make up the Sermon on the Mount, we see the summary of the moral teaching of Jesus. It's the Sermon on the Mount that gives us the Beatitudes. It's the Sermon on the Mount that teaches us the Lord's Prayer. It's the Sermon on the Mount that gives us the Golden Rule. The Sermon on the Mount warns us about worrying. The Sermon on the Mount challenges us not to judge other people. The Sermon on the Mount are really instructions Jesus gives his followers on how to act as citizens who've been adopted into the kingdom of God and are on their way to the kingdom of heaven. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, it might surprise you. It is not about how to be right with God. The Sermon on the Mount is about how you ought to live as kingdom citizens in relationship with one another. If you get that, then maybe you won't miss what is arguably one of the most profound and prolific teachings of Jesus Christ here in Matthew chapter 5. Please allow me to teach this for a moment. At the core of what Jesus begins is him trying to under explain his relationship to the word of God. Knowing that he's going to challenge contemporary interpretation of the word of God, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Before he utters a word, he says, let me make it clear. I did not come to destroy the law. Read that when you get home. He says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Dr. Cook, you understand that when you see Jesus use the term the law and the prophets, he's referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the Nevi'im, the writing of the prophets. Teach the Bible, Pastor Wesley. He's talking about Jewish holy scripture. He's talking about the Bible of its day. And Jesus says, I have come not to destroy the word of God, I've come to fulfill it. That word fulfill he uses in verse 21, it, it literally has the connotation of a cup that has not been filled to the top. And what Jesus is arguing is that you all have the Torah, you have the law, you have the prophets, you have the Bible, but your use of it is not full of the will of God. You're quoting it, but you ain't living it right. You are citing it exactly, but you're not applying it correctly. It's on the lips of those who claim to be righteous, but it ain't translating into righteous living. And so Jesus comes to give them a fuller explanation of what the word of God really meant because he understands, and here's the danger in our world today, that you can use the word of God in a way that is not aligned with the will of God. Listen, if there's one thing I pray I leave as a legacy on anybody who sat under this preaching for more than two Sundays is that you will not be hoodwinked by someone's use of the Bible. Throwing scripture on something don't make it godly. Because you can make the Bible say anything. So watch what Jesus does. Zena, this is one of the most profound but, but underestimated teachings of Jesus that the world needs to hear. When you read chapter 5, and I encourage you to read this in your daily devotional, from verse 21 to verse 48, Jesus has a repetition of a phrase that shows up six times. Here's what it says. Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say. Now, don't miss that. It's six times. You've heard it said, 
Then he quotes an Old Testament passage that his listeners would have been familiar with. And then he says, but I say unto you. Don't, don't miss it. You've heard him quote it like this. But I'm telling you it ought to be applied like this. Go, go and read it when you get home. Verse 21, Jesus says, you've heard it said. Then he quotes Exodus 20, 13. In verse 22, he says, but I say unto you. Verse 27, you've heard it said. He quotes Exodus 20, 14. Verse 28, but I say unto you. Verse 31, you've heard it said. He quotes Deuteronomy 34. And then in verse 32, he says, but I say unto you. Verse 33, he quotes Leviticus 19 and Numbers 30, and then says, but I say unto you. Verse 38, he says, you've heard it said, he quotes Leviticus 24 and Deuteronomy 9, and then in verse 39, he says, but I say unto you. In verse 43, he says, you've heard it said, and he quotes Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 23, and then in verse 44, he says, but I say unto you. It's this repeated pattern that happens six times. And in Nietzsche, it happens so much, it should not escape our understanding. You've heard it said, is Jesus' reference to how the Pharisees were using the word of God. But I say unto you, is his corrective action for the people to realize that just because they said it doesn't mean they're living it right. It is a criticism of contemporary religious use of the word of God. Jesus says, let, let me make this clear because you've heard it, but you've not seen it correctly. They are misusing it. They're misapplying it. They're putting their own spin on it. So I want you to hear what I say. Let me make clear for you what the will of God is in the word of God that you just read. Okay, I see you a little quiet. Let's start in verse 21, the first example. Jesus says, you've heard it said, and then he quotes the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. You've heard it. He says, y'all hear that every Sunday. Every, every time you go to temple, they quote the Ten Commandments, and number six is that you shall not commit murder, and anyone who commits murder will be judged. He says, now that's what they said. But you missed what God meant. So Jesus puts his spin on it. Watch what he says. With Craig Wellborn, he says, but I say unto you that anyone who is angry with his brother or his sister is in danger of the same judgment as murder. Oh, teach Pastor Wesley. Uh, the judgment of murder is the same judgment that's coming in your anger. You see, y'all thought God was just talking about killing somebody. No, the Lord is talking about your anger. Hear me, beloved, Jesus is not saying that murder and being angry are the same thing. What he's saying is that murder is an act of anger. And when anger is uncontrolled, anger will hurt others. Wait, wait, anger will hurt you. Wait, wait, anger will hurt your walk with God. Wait, wait, anger will hurt your witness of God that there is a danger in anger. And if you read it and just thought murder, you missed what the Lord was really trying to say, and that is that there is a danger in being angry. Especially what Jesus tries to press on us is how very quickly, how very easily, and how very dangerously anger escalates. That, that, that's what he means when he says, if you're angry, you'll be judged. If you call someone raka, you're subject to the council. If you call someone fool, you're subject to hell. It's an escalation of anger. It starts as a feeling. But then it manifests 
in calling someone Raka. Now, you don't know what that means. Raka, scholars can't even tell you. It's an Aramaic term that basically is a cuss. It starts with a feeling you have that then escalates into some cuss that you deem on somebody. And then you call them a fool, and a fool in that day meant that you were worthless and we could treat you as you want. So here it is, when you're angry, you got to be careful because it will escalate from a feeling to hostility to you now damaging and destroying people because you are justified in your anger. I love it. Do you know when your walk with God is most in jeopardy? When you're angry. I know you got to act like you don't get mad, so let me testify on behalf of all the liars in church. Um, when I'm angry, I don't care what the Bible says. When I'm angry, I don't want to pray about nothing. No, we cannot hold hands and talk to God when I'm angry. When I'm angry, I don't care what the preacher said last Sunday. When I'm angry, holiness and righteousness goes out the window. I don't give. Uh, uh. Uh. Dr. Judy is a a big Marvel comic fan, you know that. She finds a way to integrate Marvel into just about every sermon she preaches. And <laughs> This new generation met the Incredible Hulk on Avengers. But if you're from my generation, we met the Incredible Hulk on Friday nights on CBS. He came on right before the Dukes of Hazard and right before Dallas. And uh, uh, we knew about Incredible Hulk. It was a story of Dr. Bruce Banner. Dr. Bruce Banner had been exposed to some gamma radiation, which created the Hulk inside of him. So he knew he was Bruce Banner, but he also knew he had the Hulk. Now, the Hulk inside him was not the same Hulk that y'all see in Avengers Endgame, sitting down having coffee with folk. That wasn't the Hulk we knew. The Hulk we knew when he came out, everything was about to get busted up. Furniture was going to be moved. Smoke was going to be in the city. Somebody was going to get their feelings hurt. And Bruce Banner tried to warn folk every time. He said, don't make me angry. Because you won't like me when I'm angry. Somebody, you're laughing about Bruce Banner, but that ought to be the shirt on you wear on Sundays and Monday and Tuesday. Uh, my name is such and such, but don't make me angry because you won't like me when I'm angry. I wish I had some real saints who could declare, don't let my Bible fool you. Don't let this church outfit fool you. Don't let what I'm singing in Amazing Grace fool you if you get me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. And what Jesus is trying to press is that the cost of anger is usually greater than the cause of anger. Well, somebody just called a flashback. You ought to say, man, uh, acting in anger will cost you more than the actual cause of your being angry. He said there's something fake about your Christianity if you're always angry. Beloved, can, can you pause for a moment and think about how angry the world is we live in? Everybody is angry. Just watch how they act if you try to get in front of them. <laughs> Angry. Just listen to how folk talk to food service personnel. Angry. 
Look at how nasty you are to the pharmacist and CVS. Just nasty. <laughs> Everybody's always so angry. Let me pause and pull the car over and keep the engine running. That's the problem I have with one of them candidates for president. Because he fuels, fertilizes, and fosters an angry in America that we're angry about this group. And you know what? Something is really wrong with you if you are angry with people you don't even know. You just angry because they don't look like you. You just angry because they want to live where you live. You just angry because they want their kids to have the benefits your kids have. You just angry because they trying to cross and you don't even know no immigrants. And you angry at folk you don't even know. Angry, angry, angry. And Jesus says, your, your Christianity, your faith is super fake. If you say you love Jesus, you walk around angry all the time. You say you love the Lord, and you cussing folk out. You come to church, God is good, and you mean. You got a I love Jesus bumper sticker on your car. And at a rally talking about you're going to kill folk if your, your candidate don't make it to the White House. There's something wrong with your faith if you walk around angry with everyone all the time. You cannot sing praises to the Lord and say you love Jesus and you're mean and ugly and nasty to people you meet. There's something wrong. There's a danger in your anger. So, so watch, watch what Jesus says. He says, so here's what, here's what I'm telling you that commandment meant. Not just to not murder. He says, and I want you to know the necessity of reconciliation. Ooh, Zine's about to get real quiet. It's about to get real quiet. It's about to get real quiet. Watch what Jesus said. He said it, not me. He said, if you come to the altar and you have your religious gift to give to God and you remember that a brother or sister has an issue with you, leave your offering, go get reconciled, then come back and try again. Now, I want to break this down so you understand because you, you're going to misread it. Jesus said, if, if you're in church and you remember somebody's got an issue with you, I want to make, make sure you understand what that phrase is. That phrase is tis katasu in Greek, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a term that literally means someone has an issue with you, not because they don't like you, but because you did something to them. Uh, th this phrase in the Bible literally means someone is offended and you are the offender. No, no, this ain't no commandment to say just go out and find folk that don't like you. No, this is a commandment to say go to the folk that you know you've done wrong to and reconcile. Watch it, watch it, watch it. says, because when you get to the altar, you should remember that someone's got an issue with you. When you come to the altar, you should remember that you've done somebody wrong. When you come to the altar, you ought to remember that you offended somebody. J Judy, I, I, was, I was reading, and I had to read in the original Greek, and I don't want to get too deep, but the term remember is in the passive voice. In the passive voice, it means that the subject is not in control of the verb. The subject is the receiver of the verb, which simply means this. It doesn't mean you remember. It means you were made to remember. Uh, when you get to the altar, something ought to make you remember that you are not in right relationship with some folk that you've done wrong and that is affecting your walk with God. Here it is. Part of the work of the Holy Spirit is not just to make you fall out at the altar and run around the church and talk in tongues. No, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of how ratchet you have been, how nasty you have been, how ugly you have been, and you can't come to God with that attitude. You ought never be able to be comfortable in church when you know you've offended other people. Let me put my pastor hat on. You should never feel comfortable. So here's what Jesus says. 
It's so bad that your offering is not acceptable to God. <laughs> he said, the church don't want your money if you are comfortable hurting other people and claiming you're going to serve God. That, that's what he said. He said, leave your offering, leave, leave your off, leave your offering. <laughs> tell somebody, tell them, leave it. Just leave, just leave it right here. <laughs> Al, this is so deep. He says, whatever you're bringing to God is hypocritical if you're comfortable being in broken relationship. Your praise is unacceptable. Your amen is fake. Your hallelujah is hypocritical. If you think worship will mask your behavior. There's something wrong and fake about folk who feel that worship on Sunday excuses everything else you've done. We saw this. How many of y'all went to Ghana with us a few years ago? A few years ago, if you went to Ghana. How many of y'all been to Ghana? Anybody, anybody seen the point no return, slave quarters? Uh, it's a humbling experience. It's a humbling experience to be in those slave caves in pitch blackness. And the only sun you see is pointing to a ship that's about to enslave you and sell you across the Atlantic Ocean. You feel our ancestors. You don't know what it's like to be in the cave where the female slaves were kept and be told that you're standing on fossilized menses and defecation. It's horrible where they were kept. And what's worse is that right above the slave caves was the church. The slave traders built their house of God directly on top of where the slaves were kept. As if singing Amazing Grace could drown out the cries of humans that you were enslaving. How hypocritical to think that your worship excuses your enslavement. That your worship masks over the damage you've done to other people. That, that somehow what you do on Sunday can, can balance out the ugly and the evil of the week long. Jesus said, no, that's not real. So this is what you do, go reconcile. Stop trying to be right with God and be okay being broken with other people. Go reconcile. Zena read it early in Romans 12. Paul says, as much as you can, live at peace with all people. Because the same spirit that will make you shout will help you say, I'm sorry. The same spirit that made you holler amen, will teach you to apologize. The same spirit that makes you want to be holy will humble you to reconcile with someone you've done wrong to. See how quiet it gets? Go reconcile. Because there's danger and anger. There's a necessity of reconciliation because there's the imminence of judgment. Tell somebody, tell them judgment's coming. Oh, it's going to get real. Marcus, play something because it's going to get quiet. It's about to get real quiet. It's about to get real quiet. Watch what Jesus says. He says, listen, go reconcile and try to do it with the person that has an issue with you 
Because the minute someone offended someone else and they owed, it was on the way to the judge for verdict. So here's what Jesus says, go fix it because judgment is imminent. Go fix it because the judge is going to have to weigh out the facts. Go fix it before it gets to judgment because you can't treat people any way you want and not think there's judgment. Oh, you can't live any way you want and think there's no judgment. Here's what he's literally saying. You need to know that God is watching and at some point you will be held accountable for how you've done other folk. Uh, b b beloved, can I tell you what, what super fake Christianity is? It's living as if there's no judgment for what you do. As if God is not watching and keeping record of our lives. And, and when you know God is watching, it ought to change how you behave. Let, let me give you an example. Um, I, I, I do this to y'all's prayers. I've told you all the time, I'm not a perfect Christian. I'm, I'm making progress uh, most of the time. And I'm, I'm making progress. Um, and, and I know, I know, I know that every now and then I'm prone. Every, every blue moon, I'm prone to use some words that ain't in the Bible. I know, I know um, it shocks my staff all the time that every now and then I, I am prone. Uh, um, I'm not real restrained on Sunday at sermon time, but, but I gotta let you know that deep within me, every now and then boils up some, 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 some I, I gave up cussing for seek. And as soon as Seek was over, the devil got me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little bit every now and then. I just want you to know. So, so, so it, I, 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 I want you to know where I got it from. I got it because my dad would, would cuss every now and then. And, 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 and I, I would listen to him. He cussed, and, and I thought that meant I could cuss. And have you ever had that moment when you tried to cuss around your mama or daddy. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I tried it. <laughs> my dad let me know you don't do that around me and I realized that there's some things I don't do around my dad because I respect him too much. There's some things I don't say around my father because I love him too much, because I revere him too much, that there's some things I change in me when I know he was watching me. How can you live the way you do and act like God in watching you? Jesus says, no, it's fake to think you can treat people any way you want and there be no judgment. Can I push it and then we get out of here? He says, and if it doesn't go your way, you will wind up in prison. Somebody say prison. I want you to make sure you hear what he didn't say. He said you wind up in hell. He said you wind up in prison. He says if you don't reconcile and fix this, you'll be in prison he didn't say hell. Hell is the prison for the dead. There's also a prison for the living. Jesus didn't say you're going to hell for being angry, but you will be imprisoned in this life. You know what prison is? It's missing the abundant life Jesus wants you to have. You know what prison is? Living in misery every day of your life. You know what prison is? Bearing the weight of fear because your fear is greater than your faith. You, you know what prison is? 
Prison is not having the joy and peace of God that helps you lay down at night and sleep in the middle of the storm. You know what prison is? Prison is not having that anchor to your soul that allows you to believe you can stand through any storm that comes your way. You know what prison is? Prison is being so scared of your enemy that you capitulate to their demands and not trust that you have a God who will fight your battles for you. You can live in a prison in the here and now. And the greatest prison that you can live in when you've done people wrong is the prison of regret. Watch what Jesus says. It's time to get out of here. He says, because judgment's coming. Time is running out. I know who I came to teach this to today. But the Lord's word to you is that you need to fix this because time's running out. You know what you don't want to be? You don't want to be that, that daughter, that son that stands at the funeral in tears because you didn't fix it before time ran out. You will live with that the rest of your life. Life. Here's your assignment. Fix this because time's running out. Have the difficult conversation before it's too late. Apologize before this thing becomes generational in your family. Make amends with your sister. Because she's the only one you got. Time is running out. Judgment is coming. And if you don't fix this, you will regret it for the rest of your life. Here's what God said. There's a danger in anger. There's a necessity of reconciliation. Because judgment is imminent. Pray with me. God, I ask in this moment at, in worship as we are at the altar that your Holy Spirit would cause us to remember those whom we've hurt and harmed. That we'd hear the words of the Apostle Paul to do our very best as much as we can to live at peace. And I know, oh God, that there's a head bowed right now that you are calling to a space of reconciliation. The devil's already trying to talk them out of it to tell them she's not going to hear you, he's not going to be accepting. God, I pray that you would pave the way. That you would pave the way for these, your sons and daughters, who don't just want to hear the word, but want to live it fully. As we go into our spaces of reconciliation and difficult conversations and humility of apologizing, I pray, God, that you be in those conversations, you be in those moments, that even if it doesn't turn out the way we want, we know we've done right by you. Judgment is coming. Time is running out. I pray now, O oh God, that we'll be obedient to your spirit's command to go and be reconciled to our brothers and our sisters. This is our assignment, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Family, today if you're here and you know what it feels like to be broken in a relationship, there's no greater relationship broken than your relationship with the Lord. Every time we sin, we step away further from God's love for us. And God continues to come after you. You know what it's like for God not to let you go. You know why? Because you're still alive, even though you messed up. I wanna invite you to come to the Lord today. I wanna invite you to begin living out the word of God. I wanna invite you to a church where we're far from perfect, but we're seeking to share and show the love of Jesus Christ with everyone we meet. Church, where we encourage you through the teaching of God's word and the praying of the people of God, through connection and relationship to grow in your walk with the Lord. 
So if you're here today and you desire to give your life to the Lord, to give your life back to the Lord, if you desire to become part of something bigger than yourself that you feel God is calling you to belong to, I want to invite you in this moment of invitation to come to the altar. Our deacons will come. Our congregation stands. And if you're here in this space today and you feel the Lord moving on your heart, don't debate it. Don't chalk yourself out of it. Don't fight with it. Simply say yes. Make your way from the balcony. Make your way from the overflow. Come to Jesus. Come to our church family today. Won't you come? Family, let's sing together. We offer Christ to you. Won't you come, my sister? Come, my brother. And we offer Christ to you, my sister. If you're in the balcony, you can come even now. If you're in overflow, make your way to the sanctuary. God bless you, my sister. God bless you, my brother. He will give you brand new life. To those watching online, you can do the exact same thing. Go out to our website, fill out our form. Join us even from where you are in the World Wide Web. Time is running out, won't you come? Tomorrow's not promised to you. Today is your chance. Won't you come as we extend it once again? We offer Christ to you, my brother and my sister. Oh, my brother. And we offer Christ. Oh, my sister. He will give you. life abundantly so come you may be seated beloved come on won't you come to Christ God how grateful we are for the hearts of your sons and daughters who you've called and claimed on this day we pray now that as we connect them to you and to this body of Christ Jesus that they will grow in their walk with you. Lord, that they will be so excited and filled with your love that they shared with others, that we bear the good witness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be good stewards of the decision they've made today as we welcome them to this, your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We welcome our sisters and brothers who come today. Our deacons are gonna take them to our ready room where we share with them the amazing things that God has in store. Would you help me celebrate those who've given their life and said yes to Jesus on today? As we get ready to leave, don't forget to join us this Tuesday at 7 p.m. as we welcome the Reverend Dr. John Faison from Nashville, Tennessee, Watson Grove Baptist Church to be in worship. Sign up for our children, our Junior Youth Fellowship Fridays. You can go online, remember, second grade to eighth grade. And if you would, please be mindful to be obedient and prayerful as God will move upon your heart to give and to support through the tithe and the offering. We're blessed now as Royal Priesthood lifts up our final selection and we leave in the grace and the peace of God. now to the almighty the all wise the eternal the sovereign the faithful and omnipotent god who alone is creator of heaven and earth 
to the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who always and alone is our Christ. He is our loving Lord, our sacrificial savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning redeemer. To the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power, from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return said amen. Amen. Go in the grace of God and may the grace of you.